I want to talk to you guys about uh, PowerShell and Service Manager and uh, Service Management Automation. There are three technologies that I've spent uh, quite a lot of time with over the past two years plus, actually more, more like three to four uh, for some of them. And um, they're, they're technologies that uh, offer a lot of value when you use them together. And so I want to demonstrate some of that value and some of the things that you can do uh, with those as well as give you a few tools so you can use the things that I'm playing with and get that same value yourselves in your own environment. My name is Kirk Monroe. I go by the, the nickname Poshaholic. Uh, that's the name I grabbed eight years ago now when I first started using PowerShell and I realized it was as much of a game changer as it was uh, back when it was called Monad. And um, yeah, so I shifted my career from doing traditional software development to uh, doing hardcore Windows PowerShell, literally 100% of my day job as well as uh, my, my hobbies in the evening. And um, I haven't looked back since. A uh, bit of details about me. Um, how many people recognize this? So my son um, was a big fan of Lego, still is, and uh, always building stuff. So this is Power GUI. Uh, that's another picture of the same thing. I used to work on the Power GUI team at Quest Software, um, first as a uh, architect or evangelist, then architect, then product manager. Uh, for a number of years. And then after that, I left and I switched to another product. How many people in the room are familiar with PowerWF? Okay, so PowerWF is a, or was, because uh, it's not around right now, a PowerShell product that allowed you to uh, switch back and forth between, between a visual workflow and a PowerShell script. It was the first one that uh, provided that support. And it integrated with the System Center stack to allow you to do some interesting things uh, in System Center. Um, with with all of that work, uh, that amounted to about seven or eight years, uh, it was all focused on PowerShell. A lot of that is why I uh, became an MVP and why I've maintained my MVP over the years. And uh, most recently, since then, uh, I've switched to a company called Provence, um, where we don't do PowerShell specifically, we do IT asset management, but I'm the PowerShell guy, the automator in the company, and I still spend uh, at least half of my time focused on uh, what we can do with PowerShell, how we can uh, help customers use our product or just use the products that we plug into in general with PowerShell and, and what are the opportunities that, that lie therein. Something with the letter P. I don't know why, but all these start with P and I don't, it's just a habit, I guess, but um, anyway. Oh, by the way, for me, uh, any questions that you have during the presentation, please bring them up. I don't script my presentations. I know some presenters like to create the presentation, rehearse the content, and then deliver what they rehearsed. I much prefer off-the-cuff, interactive. If you have questions, that can help me figure out where you'd like me to go with this talk because I can't know ahead of time before coming to the room what your expectations are and what you want. So please chime in and I'll do my best to help answer those questions uh, on the fly. Um, so this talk uh, is going to be about limitations and opportunities that exist in uh, Service Manager and SMA. Um, first, show of hands, how many people use Service Manager? Okay, good. And what about SMA? Who knows what SMA is? So SMA is Orchestrator v.next, for those who don't know. Uh, well, not v.next. It's more SMA is a new runbook uh, automation engine that is part of the Orchestrator product that exists today. And um, it's based on PowerShell workflow. And so it's just it's another way of running workbooks through the, through the orchestration uh, Runbook engine uh, that leverages 100% PowerShell. So um, I like it because I much prefer doing PowerShell scripting to uh, working with a visual drag and drop interface. And SMA opens up orchestration to the entire PowerShell ecosystem versus the older Runbook engine, which is limited to the integration packs that are available uh, that you happen to have installed. And PowerShell um, is really well positioned to bring these solutions closer together because both of them plug into PowerShell. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk about how we can uh, how we can leverage that. So what are the limitations and opportunities in this uh, environment? Um, SESM is in need of some innovation. People who know SESM <laughs> know it's in need of some innovation. Uh, if you look at SESM, since 2010, not a lot has happened. Um, and so 
there are a lot of technologies that have advanced outside of SCSM that SCSM would do wise to plug into as they look into uh, improving that product and that platform going forward. SMA offers some of the, of the innovation that SCSM needs. So to give you an example of um, some of the innovation that's lacking in SCSM, Surface Manager architecture is such that you install a primary management server, which is your workflow server, and all the workflows that run inside of your service management environment are run on that server, which is a bottleneck because uh, the more load that you put on that server, the harder you're, you're hurting the performance of the SASM system, and you, you will notice. You can scale out SQL on the back end, you can scale out access into SASM on the front end by installing uh, secondary management servers that clients connect into, and then you can load balance all that. But it still goes through this this bit of a funnel through the, uh, as far as workflows go, uh, in SESM through this primary management server. SMA allows you to run workflow at scale. So the two of them bring some interesting opportunities. They're both under the system center umbrella. And so I started asking the question, well, how can we tie those two together? Because I don't care so much about core SCSM processes. When you install SCSM, it has a bunch of workflows. Those run on a regular basis. And some uh, partner products, Provence included, and, and many other companies out there, create workflows that run on the um, primary management server, the workflow server, and that's necessary. But then every shop has their own needs for little workflow pieces, little plugins, uh, management, pack, management packs that they want to use in SCSM to tailor it for their environment and for their needs. And each of those that you add, add load where it's not necessarily needed or it's not necessarily the right place to add that load. And so if you go into environments where you see 300 plus workflows, which I have done before, that you start, and they are saying, well, the performance of this program and this platform sucks, you start saying, well, this is why it sucks because you've got too many workflows going. So um, so you can use the two together and, and, and it uh, really helps uh, manage the uh, product and bring it to uh, a different level. And both SCSM and SMA speak PowerShell, but I put SORTA. And the reason I put SORTA is because you know how in English, or actually in, in many different languages, in English or in French, there's different dialects. So SCSM has its own way of doing PowerShell. SMA has its own way of doing PowerShell. They aren't necessarily the PowerShell way, they're more of a dialect thing. And so um, that poses some, some challenges. Uh, to speak to some of those challenges, uh, I'll get to those in, I think, the next slide. Let's see. Yeah. So, SESM and PowerShell. Um, SESM comes with 118 native commandlets uh, on the box, but when you want to use those commandlets, unless you realize how where those commandlets are stored on the file system, you have to, uh, well, there's one of two approaches. You go into the SESM management console, and then in the right-hand side, there's an action that says, I want to open up a PowerShell session, and that'll load all the things you need to use, and, and then you can access these 118 native commandlets. But if you're working outside of that console, it's just in regular PowerShell, and you want to use these things, you've got to load those modules manually. And that's because the architecture of how the SESM team has set up the PowerShell modules on the system does not jive with uh, how PowerShell modules are supposed to be placed on a system so that they're discoverable in PowerShell version 3 and later so that you get auto-loading and everything just works. So that's part of the whole dialect thing where the two of them don't, don't necessarily work together. Um, not quite the way that they should. Um, so I looked at that and I looked at the fact that I'm doing a lot of automation with SCSM and, and with me, typically when I get my fingers into something with PowerShell, I start seeing in some of these problems slash opportunities and I want to fix them. And so my solution to fix them is usually to create a star PX module. So I've got SESM PX as a module. That module adds 157 commands uh, and counting that are complementary to the 118 out of the box. It makes the SESM native uh, commands discoverable automatically because I'm handling the where it is on the system uh, and auto-loading those for you so that it, it solves that problem. Um, I underline complementary because when you're dealing with SES7 PowerShell, there's a bit of a history that's worth uh, understanding. So SESM didn't used to include PowerShell 
uh, support out of the box. But a couple of Microsofties created a module called SMLets, and SMLets was a great solution for PowerShell and, and SCSM for a long time. But then SCSM decided, well, we're going to put PowerShell in the box, and rather than take SMLets and plug it in, they created SCSM native commandlets. So you've got two different pools. These two pools are, um, there's overlap between the two. If you load SMLets first, you can't load the SCSM commandlets. If you load the SCSM commandlets first and you load SMLets, it'll suppress an error that's actually there because there is some data differences between the two and, and the details of how they work behind the scenes. So they're not really complementary. They actually conflict, but the conflict is hidden from most people because most people go into the, the, the console using the um, action in the, in the SCSM management console, then load SMLets, it swallows the error and just says, oh, everything's good, go ahead. And, and so then you, you start using them. But that's not the right way to do things. So, so I started looking at that, and I started looking at the two conflicts and thought, well, that doesn't make sense. What really should happen is that there should be a module that builds on top of SCSM's native support rather than uh, trying to do it on the side and having conflicts between the two. And SMLets couldn't really be modified and steered back on the right path to do so because of the fact that there is a lot of uh, code out there already built on SMLets. So I, I decided that rather than playing nice with SMLets and trying to build on top of that, I had to create SCSMPX. So the two combined give you a 275 command uh, set with uh, very little overlap between the two. Um, and I'll show you what the, some of those look like. Now, uh, oh, and also SCSMPX is 100% open source and 100% written in PowerShell. It's just a PowerShell script module. So if you want to see how things work under the covers, you can get in there and do that and then figure out how to add commands and contribute as well. Now, SMA um, has its own share of opportunities. The SMA team, when they created... So you, you might think that SMA, because of the fact that it's a product that's based on PowerShell, that... Um, it would do things really, really, really well in the PowerShell world, but that's not necessarily the case because when you look at the implementation of the commands in SMA, they're done by somebody who didn't quite get PowerShell. So you can't pipeline. Looks like pipelining is set up, but it uses all the wrong parameters and it just doesn't work. Um, I don't understand that, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, so I looked at that and that's, that's, that's one problem. Another problem is that SMA, behind the scenes, has an OData interface, or REST, you can access it either way. And yet they created a closed source PowerShell module on top of this OData REST interface, which is documented. So I don't necessarily understand that. That's probably part of the Microsoft not being into the open source movement quite as much uh, yet. Um, and they didn't expose everything. And so there's some opportunities for things that could be exposed that give a lot of value to make it easier. And so. Again, rather than look at SMA, in, in, in this case, I mean, it comes with, nine, or sorry, SMA comes with 40 commands. I thought, do I build on top of that foundation? But I can't because there's just some intrinsic details that are broken. And so I've got SMAPX as a complementary solution on the side that can be used, and I use, in replacement of some of the SMA functionality to give me pipelining support and to address some of these problems and fill some of the gaps that are left uh, in, in SMA in the native commandments. Again, SAS, or sorry, SMAPX is open source, 100% PowerShell. And so, so, so those are two solutions that add value and I'll show you what those look like. And then there's another opportunity with all of these products used together. How many people have created a management pack for either uh, Opsman or for SESM? So not many people, and that's not surprising. Um, creating a management pack is traditionally a dev uh, task because it involves C Sharp, XAML, XAML, XML, MP files, uh, management pack bundles, uh, knowing how to package them up properly, how to sign them, how to put everything, all, all the bits together, create a couple of DLLs and deploy it on the system. And all of that work is very fragile and if in your XML you've got this one small little error, it can cause problems that don't work and trying to find that can be a really painful experience. So, but that needs to exist. This whole SDK thing needs to exist. If any of you were here for uh, Jim's talk yesterday about the work that he's done with providers, 
you need the whole full featured SDK for the dev world because people go out and create product on that and extensions and they're complex but they add a lot of value and they need the full-blown functionality to plug in and do what they need to do. Then you go down to a person who is an integrator who's implemented SMA or sorry SESM in their environment and they have a need where they want to basically have a workflow that runs on a schedule and that workflow they know how to do it in PowerShell perhaps but trying to take a PowerShell workflow and run that as a workflow um, inside of S SESM, inside of a management pack, that's versioned, is a lot of work. And so there's some opportunity to, to reimagine how management pack authoring could be done on the down level scale for the people who are doing uh, workflows and, and for the people who have the smaller needs. So I created another module, SESM MPC, Management Pack Configuration, uh, PX. By the way, the PX name, in case you're wondering, or the PX suffix, is because most of my solutions are remedies to problems and looks a lot like RX, but it's PowerShell, and so I adopted PX, and so <laughs> that's why everything I, I create with modules these days is PX. So again, open source, 100% PowerShell, although it uses a module behind the scenes that has a binary component, but that's also open source. And um, it provides a DSL to make management pack authoring much easier. So let's get back into my desktop environment and show you what some of this stuff looks like. Uh, so what first? Um, everybody with me so far? Okay. Yes. So, I don't have time. Good. So, um, let me get rid of the long path and make sure I've got nothing loaded. Okay. So, if you want to work with, um, I mentioned if you want to work with PowerShell inside of SESM, you typically go into the management console I know this is small, um, but you know, there's a start PowerShell session on the side. And so if you go into that, that'll open up a PowerShell session and load the modules for um, SESM. And it does that magic by just invoking a couple of import module commands with uh, file system paths. And by the way, if you typically, if you see something like this in the product and you're wondering how do they do that, what are they doing behind the scenes when they're going through and, and setting this stuff up, um, you could often just look at history. And so um, I'm not going to zoom this console link. I'm going to close it in just a second. But basically, the history shows you exactly what they're doing. They import one module. They create a connection to your primary management server. They import a second module. And then they're done. You've got your environment set up. So I took that logic, and I put that into um, my PowerShell module, uh, SESM PX, and made all of those commands discoverable. So because it's discoverable, when I don't have the module loaded, I can invoke uh, get SESM PX incident. And that'll find the module, find, well, find my module, which internally finds the other modules, loads them up, and leverages the commands that are available behind the scenes, and, and does some magic on the top of that, and, and then exposes um, the results back. So it takes a second to go through and do that that discovery and load process, um, but then I get back my, my instance in my environment. So I can do automation without having the module loaded. Um, now, one of the pain points in, in the implementation when you're dealing with SESM, let me go into my instant view. So if, if you're working in SESM in the console and um, you go into uh, managing different work items, incidents, change requests, whatnot, all of these things all of these, these nodes that are in the tree on the left-hand side, they all have views associated with them. And a view is basically uh, just a matching between here's the SQL query, uh, the data, or the commands to go behind the scenes and pull this data in, and these are the properties that I want to have showing up, and then just go and show it. So it's just describing how to render the, the information that's getting from SQL Server behind the scenes from the CMDB in the UI. All that work is done, which is great, but then if you want to reproduce this in PowerShell, Typically, you have to go and recreate it. So get the data, figure out what the property values are, do all the calculations if there's some calculations involved. Uh, if it uses type projections, you've got to get the data the right way, which is a challenge. And so, um, but, but views typically follow a standard format. And so I created a command, get SESMPX view data. And so that allows me to specify um, a, a view that I want to get. So in this case, I'm going to get the uh, let me think now. 
actually, I'm going to. So I've got this. This is a generic command, get SESMPX view data. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and get another, call it a different command instead, because the way that command works, it allows you to get the data from any view. Um, but in this case, I'm working with instance. And so I have created for every, pretty much for every entity that you see inside of SESM in the management console instance, change requests, activities. Um, all the work items and all the configuration items that you can think of, there are commands in this module to allow you to go and get them. And with those commands, you can indicate that you want to get a view. Um, and I've got tab completion, so uh, the built-in views are all available to me. So I've, I don't think of what's the name of the view, um, because views have complicated names behind the scenes too. So that same command I just ran, I can run it again, but this time it gives me back the actual properties uh, that are defined matched up 100% to what I have in this view. So SCSM, traditionally, the UI layer and the data layer are very tightly coupled, and that's hard to work around. And so I've started trying to figure out how do I pull those two apart and get the presentation I want in PowerShell um, while still being able to get the data I want at the same time. So that's what, that's what the get SCSM PX view data does. And all the commands that you can use, whether you're calling get SESMPX uh, change request or service request or computer, um, all of those have a dash view parameter and you can get back these views, which is very handy for reporting uh, really quickly if you need to generate some reports in your environment that you want without having to go through the process of doing a manual export in here um, or taking action on those, on those commands. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm just curious, I'm like your gets, you know, for get incident. I mean, I know what the built-in the, the ones out of the box that are horrible. Like, you know, you gotta do, you gotta like get the class first. Like you gotta go get the, you know, system.work work item dot incident class mm -hmm. and then go get the incident after getting that class. So it's very slow. Yes. I, are you still doing the same concept underneath or do you have a way to make it faster? I'm still doing the same concept underneath wherever possible where I can work with a particular object that you've already retrieved from the SDK uh, and, and then reference that object and pass it in wherever I, possible, I've been adding that. Um, so I have the same limitations because I still have to go and get the class name, but I make sure I only go and get the class name once. And, and um, when you're dealing with relationships and you want to look up related items to a particular object because SESM, uh, the CMDB is all about relationships and that's how type projections are pulled together and whatnot. There, the slow way is to just indicate the relationship name you want to look up and it'll go through and pull it up every single time. The fast way is to get your relationship first and pass it in as a parameter. And so I just recently added that to a command. So I'm trying to fix those cases. And, and so if there are things that you find that you'd like to, uh, that aren't maybe as optimal as they could be with SESMPX, if you want to try it out, uh, let me know what those things are because they're typically easy for me to add. It's just a matter of time. And, and as they come up, uh, whatever the highest right. priority well, is. I, I almost feel like it's like a limitation of the product just in general because it almost feels like when you're opening like tickets and stuff, like it's doing the same thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's like, oh, I got to, you, you double clicked on a work item that's an incident, so I got to go get the incident class and then actually go find that, all that relationship data. So yeah. I, I almost feel like it's an underlying problem. It, it is, <laughs> but I don't necessarily know that they're doing everything that they can. I mean, if you're doing a lot of automation with a certain class, there you can absolutely go and get that class once and hold on right, to it, right? right? And then leverage it throughout the whole thing. And when you're going through a UI, like the management console, are they giving you that, that same capability if you're going in different places in the UI to do things? Have they gone and captured and stored at once? Judging from the performance in the UI, I think maybe not, um, because the UI performance in SESM is, is not the best. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, if there's opportunities where I can do it, absolutely I will. And if you try stuff out and you're thinking, well, sure. see if you can optimize this and make it faster, for sure. Um, but you are limited to a certain point to what the SDK, SDK underneath the covers allows you to do. So that's um, SESM uh, PX. There's also, now that one has been out for a while uh, on GitHub. I'll show you links. I've got links for all this stuff at the end of my uh, slide deck. Um, and I've got a lot of customers that I work with that, that use this on, on a regular basis. Um, and so it, it's well tested and, and quite heavily used. The other two modules that I've been working on, SMAPX as well as SESM and PCPX, those two are more in the experimental phase right now, uh, simply because I haven't had enough time to uh, start using them heavily enough where I'm satisfied and, and I can call it a 1.0 that I would sign and say this is done. Um, they're more of a 0 0.9 or, or something along those lines. Uh, in terms of versioning, but um, I can show you what the commands look like for uh, SMA. So uh, get, actually, yeah, get module, no, command. 
So, um, the view is a big thing for uh, just dealing with views in SES MPX. Dealing with every single uh, type of item as an individual command is a big thing in SES MPX. For that, I'm leveraging proxy functions behind the scenes, so it makes it very easy. Um, another thing that's nice in SES MPX is uh, the filtering capabilities because you can do very plain English filters. And if you look at the SES MPX uh, homepage, there's examples of that. Um, SMA has different opportunities that, needs, that it tries to solve. One of those is there's no way that I could figure out in the existing commands to say I want to test this run book and I want the results back in my environment. So as you're going through and creating run books, which are just PowerShell workflows, and you want you, 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 you typically would create a workflow locally, try it out locally, uh, make sure it's working properly, then push it into uh, SMA, try it out there, make sure it's still working properly, and then publish it. Some of those steps are missing in terms of automation and, and how, how things should work. And so even testing a run book, I have to go into, um, I think I have it open. I have to go into the uh, WAP console for SMA and go and browse through and find my run book. Just one second while that refreshes. Um, once I find my run book, then I've got to go into, okay, close my window, hang on. So, so yeah, so I would typically go into SMA and I go to automation and then I want to look at my run books because I know that's the one I wanted to test. And so then when I'm going to go test that one, I've got to come down to the bottom of the page and it's on the next page. So I've got to find the run book I want, which I can search for or just browse to. Go into that run book, go to the author tab, go in draft, and then I can test it. And so all that's a lot of stuff that I don't want to do because it's all UI and, and I can do things faster with PowerShell. And so I exposed in SMAPX, um, get back to my window, uh, I exposed in SMAPX a command test-sma runbook, which will run the runbook and give you back the results inside of your PowerShell session. Um, because it's running on a runbook worker, you're obviously not getting back uh, serialized data, you're getting back deserialized objects, but it still it runs and it works and it makes things a lot easier. Um, Another thing that this allows me to do is to uh, run a runbook in SMA and wait for that, which will create a job. So um, let me see. No, I haven't scripted this, so I'm going to just give it a try. So SESMPX test is a runbook. I'm going to publish it. Uh, in the UI, so I might as well just do it right there. There is a publish command in SMA. Um, so the, it's published now. I can go to the Publish tab. I can see my run book. And now if I were to run this, typically I would come into the UI here. I would hit Play, run the run book, or I might start the run book from the SMA commandlets. But then if I want to see the results, I've got to come into the UI and look at the results. And again, it's, it's UI, and, and, and we're talking about PowerShell. And so that's, that's annoying to me. So oh, there I went with the minimize window again. So what I did is. Uh, Start SMA PX runbook, and the name was uh, SMA PX test, and I'm going to pipe that to eight. And I, forgive me if this doesn't work again. This is on the experimental side of the fence, and I, I tweak it regularly. And I had been playing with it this week, and so it's possible they may have broken something. Um, but you know how. Uh, the PowerShell job commands work, where you start a job, and then you wait for the job to complete, and then you receive job to get the data. I like that experience. It makes sense to me. I thought the same thing should exist for SMA jobs. It doesn't, and so I added it. Uh, so when I run this, so it starts the job, and, uh, and then once that's done, it'll give me back the results. SMA jobs take a while because there's a fair amount of its workflow. It's on a runbook server, which has got to run it on the runbook um, worker. And, and so it takes a little bit of time for that to go through and actually run. But that's, that's one of the examples. Trying to do this in SMA with PowerShell out of the box, you just can't. So these are the kind of things they've been adding. If you find gaps and you're working with SMA and there's something you'd like to do with automation and you think it should work because you can do it with the UI, feel free to ping me, let me know. Um, I'll help you work it out uh, because this, this is really close to getting into a um, 
stable state out of the experimental phase. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, I'll, I'll be happy to work all this stuff out. You just have to be patient with jobs. I mean, that's why there's jobs, right? Because these things do take a while. So I could have just started it and captured the job and then came back later and looked at it uh, because these things just take a while to go through and, and do the work. And they also take a little while because the way I'm doing this behind the scenes for this to work is I actually have to create a, 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 a runner run book that goes through and then runs my run book I'm running and gets back the results as deserialized and or deserializes them and then passes them back to the PowerShell. That's the way I had to make that work. So it, it takes a while to go through that whole process. I'm just going to let that run um, while I go through and talk about uh, my favorite of all of these things, which is management packs and how that should be easier. So, um, although I'd like to use this console. I'm just gonna actually control. So, so this typically works, it just takes a while. And I really don't wanna wait, wait for it because I've only got 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna stop that and, and move on to the other thing I really wanted to demo to you guys today. So. I mentioned with management packs, when you create management packs, it's, it's, it's a dev task. It's a lot of work. You use Visual Studio and, um, well, you don't have to, but most often you would use Visual Studio. You would use the um, SCSM authoring tool and a combination of all these things and a lot of steps to go through and build a management pack. But I wanted it to be easier. And so the use case I'll talk about is a very common pain point for customers when you're dealing with SM, or when you're dealing with, um, SESM. In shops that use SESM, they have a process where instances are open and then a CSR goes and works through the process, figures out what's wrong, closes out the incident, but doesn't mark it as resolved at the end. Or sorry, marks it as resolved but not closed, other way around. So they'll mark it as resolved, and, and, but for bookkeeping purposes, you need to close them out. And they always forget to do that. It's a very common problem widespread throughout the SESM community. So years ago, when I worked for uh, the guys at DevFarm and PowerWF, one of the things that our product came with was a management pack that did this auto-close. And this is back 2000, uh, let me think, six, uh, maybe nine, 10. Um, yeah, around 2010 timeframe. And so we had this product that came with this management pack and the product did a ton of cool stuff with creating workflows and tied in with PowerShell and all these great things. And we had customers who came to us and said, I don't give a crap about any of that. I want that damn management pack. Mm -hmm. And they would spend $3,500 and say, here you go. And they take the management pack and then they're often happy. So that's, that's how much of this is actually a pain point for people. These days, that same management pack uh, functionality is available for free via Provence, via Cyrus and via a bunch of different companies. But, um, it's, uh, it's just one of those pain points that people think, well, it should just be out of the box. And so how would I solve that if I didn't have these free tools? Or more, um, more specifically for me, who created the free tool that we use at work, how do I create this without having to go through all this management back crap and, and actually do the work? And so that was my inspiration behind this uh, particular uh, module. So the way I create it is, um, this, so th this is actually, running it. So yeah, this, this defines my management pack. So I created a DSL, a domain specific language. Domain specific languages in PowerShell are great because they allow you to take something that um, normally uh, maybe would require a heck of a lot of code in terms of individual command calls and bubble it up more as a configuration item, much like PowerShell DSC. So this management pack configuration uh, language is defining what my management pack is going to be. So I define a management pack auto close, and this is the exact code I use to create the management pack that we give to customers pre-built for, for free when they want it. So I give the management pack a name. I give it a bunch of properties, company name, copyright date, whatnot, uh, version number, so I can then go and make uh, uh, updates to it later on. I give it a bunch of uh, build options, so where do I want the output files to go because it's gonna create a management pack uh, bundle for me, and so where do I wanna find that at the end? Uh, if it has an icon, Strong name key file is used to actually take your management pack and, and, and sign it. Uh, code signing cert is used to actually sign the um, DLLs that are built, that are part of the management pack solution. And then something that you use with management packs often is uh, an admin UI. This is a very common scenario. You, you take a management pack and you want to have it do something, but you also want it to be somewhat 
excuse me, somewhat configurable. And you want that configuration to be in the UI. Normally, you would have to go through and create this UI inside of the authoring tool. But instead, for stuff that's boilerplate, if it's just a big, big property bag of a bunch of settings, I figured out how I could define that UI in, uh, in this DSL. So admin settings indicates it's an administration uh, settings pay, uh, property sheet. Um, and then inside of that, I have different pages, different configuration, or so different uh, groups of the properties. And then I define what are the properties. So I've got a Boolean. There's the name of the Boolean. Here's a label that'll show up in the UI and it gives a default value. And same things for integers, and you can also do string properties. And that's as far as I've gone in terms of properties because it's fairly lightweight so far. Um, but that still actually serves the purpose really, really well for, um, for creating this stuff and being able to do a lot of things with management packs. Beyond the UI, then you need to figure out, well, when's my management pack gonna run? And so, or my workflow, right? Because I'm talking, this is, this is a scenario where you just wanna add a workflow to SESF to do some things. So I want my workflow to run on a daily schedule at midnight. Um, so I name my schedule and I give it a start time and a day of the week mask, um, which is just uh, uh, a bitwise number indicating every day of the week I want it to run at midnight. And then what I wanted to do? Well, I wanted to run a workflow. And so I define the workflow as a PowerShell script. Uh, I give it a name, display name, description. I indicate what trigger of the triggers I defined up here is it going to use. So it's going to use the daily at midnight trigger as far as scheduling goes. And what's it gonna do? Well, it's gonna execute a script block that is pulled from a uh, file. And that file is, let me get my scrolling over here, um, this invoke-autoclose work item PS1, which is great because this is my script to do all the work. And I can build that and test it and run it, make sure it does everything, closes all my uh, work items like it's supposed to, and then pull that into my uh, SDSM environment as a manager pack that's versioned and, and allow me to then um, have that built in natively and run using the uh, SESM workflow engine. So now that is putting load on the workflow server and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so that's my, my MPC demo file. Now I'm gonna run it. Now this doesn't have any pretty progress, but um, I'll show you what it's doing. So when I, when I run that and I pop over this folder, which is empty, uh, we should see show up. It takes a second to get going because it's got to load the, the modules. So there, creates a project folder, creates the folder for the actual management pack I'm creating. There's my management pack bundle folder, all of these files, C-sharp, XAML, XAML, uh, the project file. No, no Visual Studio is on this system. I didn't have to install Visual Studio. I'm just using the uh, native compiler that's available installed on, on the system. And uh, so it creates the file and then compiles it and then uh, out creates the output for the file, which is first a management pack, which then has to be um, sealed and then it's into a management pack bundle and then, um, or sorry, sealed into, into a .mp file, then bundled with the workflow into an MPB file. And so the workflow stuff is all here. Um, all of the stuff you normally have to do, it's a real pain in the ass. Um, and uh, so you go into this release folder when it's done and you have a DLL and an MPB file, and that's it. So I don't have to go through the process of dealing with all of that dev stuff. I can just create this management pack and, and uh, run it through this, this language interpreter and, and, and boss my uncle. So, um, so that's actually done. I'm just waiting for the prompt to come back. There we go. So that's how complex it is uh, to create these management packs. And the way this works behind the scenes, this leverages another module I've created that's called language PX. Um, so if I flip back to my host system, which I have to hit escape to do that. So on my host system, so I have this uh, module called language PX, which def it's a script, mo sorry, it's a binary module with a script module as well that defines how I can define uh, a domain, domain specific language. And then I have my uh, SESM MPC PX module, which actually defines the language. And so if you look at the definition, the syntax here is actually pretty, pretty simple and readable. So I'm creating a new DSL and I give it a name. I'm just using the name of the module in this case. And what's the syntax of my DSL? And so the syntax is defined by just a bunch of, um, just a bunch of uh, keywords and then maybe a property, like a name property, and then 
uh, an associated script block or a hash table. And so this does all of that magic behind the scenes. Um, this allows me to, uh, this has interpreted this language that I have here into the DSL. And then that DSL, you can build and run management packs um, on it. And if you look at the DSL the way I've defined it, there are some things that are not totally implemented yet. Uh, like I mentioned, string property was available. So here's the string property. Um, if you're wondering when you see square brackets around something, why is it square brackets around something versus something else doesn't? Square brackets indicates it's optional. Unfortunately, right now, the optional part was not implemented by default because the technology that I built this on is dynamic keywords in PowerShell. And dynamic keywords in PowerShell that came out in version 4 are only half-baked, not documented. And if you ask the PowerShell team about them, they won't answer your questions because they say this is only half-baked, and that's why it's not documented. So I went through and looked at that and thought, well, I don't want to wait for it. And so what do I need to do to make it work? And so I figured out how to make it work. For the most part, some things I haven't quite gotten to yet, like optional parameters. I also haven't gotten to um, IntelliSense, when, so that when you're working in the DSL itself and you uh, type in commands, that you get the IntelliSense for the properties on those. That's stuff I'm trying to figure out, but I haven't quite got there yet. Hence why this is also in uh, more of a uh, experimental state rather than stable. Um, but it's, it's coming. I'm working on it, and uh, I've made a ton of progress. I and mean, one of the issues that I solved with um, when you deal with uh, the keyword support in PowerShell, you can create keywords in version 4, and then they're all stored inside this master table. And then if you're working with DSC and you invoke some configuration command, the configuration command, one of the first things it does, it takes the, DS, uh, the, the keyword table and blows it away. And so that's just a part of the reason why they say this is really only half-baked. There's tons of challenges with it. So internally, I create my own table where I store all my keywords. And then when you go to invoke a keyword, I check, is it in the, DS, in the uh, keyword table, master keyword table? No, then put it there. And that way I have it dynamically on the fly. And so I work around some of these issues. It was lots of fun. Um, so triggers, yeah, I've got daily schedule. I'm working on triggers on interval, trigger, triggers based on an SCSM event. Uh, I haven't got those done yet. Uh, the types of workflows, some of these things are not commented out, but they're not yet implemented yet behind the scenes. These are the things I was working on most recently. So um, SMA runbook, if you take that example where I created my PowerShell script or it could be workflow to close instance, and that's a, uh, it, it's, it's in the PowerShell, sorry, it's written in PowerShell, it's a workflow. Why wouldn't I put that in SMA to have that run on one of many um, SMA runbook workers that then go through a load balanced secondary management server configuration to scale out what I'm doing without putting the load on the primary. And that's, that's the goal with, with this kind of solution. And so SMA runbook is going to tie in. We're just going to behind the scenes go and invoke that runbook in SMA, whatever the name is that you give it. Um, that's a piece that I didn't quite get to before this uh, demo. So um, it's coming. And um, if you guys do have interest in this and there's certain features that you really want to go after, a good time to speak up would be anytime now because that'll help me figure out priorities on, the, on all this stuff. Um, oh, and sorry, when you're defining these, if you have to play around with DSLs and you're curious about what you can do with that. So um, yeah, so you define the language, but then what's the language going to do? So at the, you have to register uh, events for them. So I can register a keyword event against any keyword name and um, I can do one of two types. I can do on invoked, meaning after this keyword has been run, then do stuff with the data versus on invoking. Um, this, the difference being this, I'll show you up here. So on invoked, a keyword event for management pack configuration basically says run this and everything you got to do inside of it and then roll it all back as a nested property bag. So it'll give me back this nested property bag of all these properties and then I can go through that, get the information I need and do some stuff. On invoking is after management pack configuration runs, but before you get to any of this internal stuff, then go to my event handler. And there's different cases where you might want to do that. That's probably for another talk on domain-specific languages, um, but that's, that's the kind of things that you can do. So I'm at 10.46. Uh, that's uh, time. Um, if you guys have questions, ask me now. Ask me for the rest of the show. I'll be around. I'm doing another talk tomorrow. Um, but uh, thanks for coming, and I hope this was interesting. Question? I guess I got one more. Could you use this to build like configuration items, um, not necessarily workflows? Um, like I have in my environment, I have a lot of custom configuration items that we keep track of. Of like, uh, they're good examples of things you can buy, like you know, new computer and stuff like that. Yep. And it's all new, you know. 
I built it in the authoring tool with a form, you know, so the guy that runs purchasing can open this form and add new items. But and it took forever. For I mean, could I have just done this with no workflow, no trigger, um, but used your form? You know what I mean? That, that so creates. You, you, you should be able to. I don't know that. I mean, I have the ability to be able to create classes and instances behind the scenes. I just haven't gotten that particular use case uh, nailed down yet, but you should be able to. Um, on the form side, one limitation with this is you're going to get boilerplate forms versus fancier forms. And also the forms right now, I've opened it for admin settings, not for just forms for a particular type of class, but that's also stuff that's coming. It's just at the very broad SDK, so I'm trying to figure out, well, where do I spend my time? And, and it's use cases like that that I like to figure out. Yes? Do you have anything in your module for uh, working with custom permissions for service offerings? No. <laughs> permissions inside of Service Manager is a really, really big uh, rat's nest. Uh, yeah, well, I, I worked at a company where we had to create different service offerings for different groups. Yep. And they wanted those service offerings to be exclusive to their groups. And we called Microsoft Support to ask them how to do it. Yep. And they told us, we don't know, we'll get back to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> And it was a very painful process. Yeah. So, yeah. So unfortunately, no, I haven't. I'm going to stay away from permissions as long as I can until a customer really, really needs me to go into it. I'm just going to push the button to stop this, and I'm going to step out of the way. Permissions for different service offerings with catalog groups.